Left, we have Melissa DeRosa, Secretary to the Governor. To my right, we have our great Secretary of State, Madam Secretary of State is the appropriate protocol, Rosanna Rosado. I thank them very much for being with us today. I thank the New Settlement Community Center for having us today uh, and for all of you being here. Today is Saturday, day 91 of this coronavirus pandemic. It's a hard day. It is a day of light. It is a day of darkness. It's a day where we see how far we have come in so many ways, uh, but yet a day where we see how far we need to go in so many ways. In battling this coronavirus, we have made great progress. The numbers today, again, are all good news in terms of total hospitalizations are way down, intubations are way down. The number of new COVID cases walking in the door every day uh, is also way down. So that is all good news. The number of New Yorkers we lost is at an all-time low. Same number as yesterday, but overall that has been tremendous, tremendous progress from where we were. Our thoughts and prayers are with the families we lost. Uh, and I want to thank the, the hospital workers, the nurses, the doctors who are just, they've saved literally thousands of lives all through this. And I want to thank them all from the bottom of my heart. I want New Yorkers to take note of what we have done. We, we accomplished this. This is not government action. This is we the people action. This is when New Yorkers come together and New Yorkers are informed and they understand the challenge and they understand the facts and the information. Uh, they did the impossible and that's what this was. Five regions in upstate New York entered phase two of the reopening yesterday. Uh, we have a next week coming up, the capital region and western New York will end there 14 days. Uh, and then we'll have to make a decision whether or not they enter phase two. We make that decision by reviewing the data and the numbers uh, and not just uh, the state officials because nobody has dealt with this pandemic before. One of the most important things in life to know is to know what you don't know, right? Uh, and know what you don't know means none of us here know uh, about this coronavirus. We've been wrong from day one. All the experts have been wrong from day one. The projection models turned out incorrect because we were better with social distancing. We were told the virus was coming from China. Really, the virus came to New York from Europe. Nobody told us. We had three million people get on flights and land in New York airports from Europe. Uh, so on these decisions of reopening, uh, I am making sure that we have the best science available and the best minds. I said from day one, we have to reopen smart. This is not emotion. This is not politics. Uh, some people want to open. Should, we should have never closed, right, when we started. This was just like the flu. Yeah, the flu doesn't kill 100,000 people. This was not the flu. Uh, so be smart and avoid the politics and avoid the emotion and stay on the data. And when we get to these phases of reopening, we have the best global experts, people who have worked with countries that have gone through this before, that have closed, that have reopened, then closed again because they reopened too fast. Uh, so I understand you have local officials who have opinions. Uh, I have opinions. But you know what? I'm not acting on my opinion. I'm not a public health official. I'm not a doctor. Know what you don't know. Uh, I go to global experts. And this is a matter of life and death. And I want to make sure I get the best advice for the people of this state. I'm not going to put anybody's life at risk unless uh, I feel confident that we have had the best advice. And that's what we do in all of these determinations. New York City is going to open on June 8th. We have work to do still, but we'll get it done by June 8th. Uh, remember, New York had the worst situation and that we've made this remarkable turnaround this quickly is something we should all be proud of. 
We're going to be focusing this next week on the hospital system. We learned painful lessons with our hospital system. We came up with a new program called Surge and Flex in the midst of this. When it comes to hospitals, we don't really have a public hospital system. We don't even really have a hospital system. We have, in the New York City area, 100 private hospitals. And private hospitals operate as private hospitals. They have uh, their own mission. They have their own business interests. They operate unto themselves. That's how it's always worked. We only have about 11 public hospitals. Uh, they're uh, in New York City, operated by New York City, called the H&H uh, &H hospitals. But there are only 11 of them. Uh, the public hospitals cannot handle any outbreak of any size. We've learned that. We need those private hospitals operating in a way they never operated before, which is basically managed as one public health system. Uh, and that's a dramatic difference from anything that happened before. And on the first go around, we had to design the airplane as we were flying it. And the surgeon flex was coming up with a management system for those private hospitals who had all acted independently. We want to make sure we have that refined over this next week, because if we have a problem, we need all of those hospitals to work together where we can shift patients, we can share resources, uh, that kind of coordination. The MTA, the public transportation, has been getting prepared. They're disinfecting trains like never before, uh, but they have another week of work to do, and they will be ready. And then we want to focus on the 10 hotspots. The 10 hotspots are those areas that we have identified through testing where we're still generating new cases. And we have, uh, we're the most aggressive state in the country in actually doing testing. And the testing tells you where the new cases are coming from. Uh, we call them hotspots. Uh, if you look at them, we can actually identify them by zip code. And it's a dramatic difference between the overall city situation and the situation in these zip codes. Overall city situation is about 19, 20% infection rate. Some of these zip codes, you have an over 50% infection rate. Just think about it. So we're targeting those zip codes as places. We want to get down that infection rate, get down the new cases in those hotspots. Uh, they tend to be in the outer boroughs, non-New Yorkers. There was a concept called outer boroughs. There is no inner borough. Manhattan is the inner borough, but nobody calls it the inner borough. Uh, I'm a child of an outer borough. I'm from Queens. Uh, Queens, Brooklyn, Bronx, Staten Island. Those are the outer boroughs. Uh, you're not in Manhattan, so you are an outer borough, which had all sorts of ramifications. But uh, you look at where the hotspots are, they're in the outer boroughs. They're in Bronx, uh, Brooklyn, predominantly Bronx, Brooklyn, uh, a little bit in Queens, actually my old neighborhood in Queens. Uh, let's focus on those zip codes over the next week. These hotspots are not coincidentally predominantly low-income and minority communities. And that again raises the issue of disparity and inequality. We're going to be adding more testing sites in these areas. We need people to come out get tested, find out who has the virus, who has the antibodies, who is possibly contagious. Even if you're a young superhero and uh, you think you're immune from the virus, you can give it to someone else. You can give it to your mother, your father, your aunt. Uh, you have people living in dense communities. You have many people in one housing complex. You can't socially distance in an elevator in public housing. It does not happen. Uh, so, the, this is where the infection rate is spread, spreading. We're going to do more PPE, more hand sanitizer, more education, more communication about how important these things are. Uh, but we have to get deeper also. And we're working with Northwell Health, which is the largest 
hospital system in the state of New York to actually develop better health care connections in these communities. Where you see a high death rate is where you have people with underlying illnesses. If you have diabetes, if you have hypertension, if you are immune compromised, then you're more likely to die. And that raises the question, well, why, why didn't we address these health disparities better? And we want to take this opportunity to do that with Northwell Health, because we have to address uh, the inequality in health care. If you look across this nation, proportionately, many more people of color died from the COVID virus than white people. That is a fact. There's a slight disparity in New York State, nothing like what it is in other states, and we're proud of that. Uh, but there is a disparity, and there is an inequality, uh, especially across this country. That has to be addressed. That has to be addressed. It came to light. It was exposed because of this situation. Uh, but it was there, and it has to be addressed. And there is a larger context for this conversation today, right? Uh, for 90 days, we were just dealing with the COVID crisis. On the 91st day, we have the COVID crisis, and we have the situation in Minneapolis uh, with the racial unrest around the George Floyd death. Those are not disconnected situations. One looks like a public health system issue, COVID, but it's getting at the inequality in health care also on a deeper level. And then the George Floyd situation, which gets at the inequality and discrimination in the criminal justice system. They are connected. Uh, the George Floyd death was not just about George Floyd, and we, we wish his family peace uh, and they're in our thoughts and prayers. But we tend to look at these situations as individual incidents. They're not individual incidents. When you have one episode, two episodes, maybe you can look at them as individual episodes. But when you have 10 episodes, 15 episodes, you are blind or in denial if you are still treating each one like a unique situation. We have an injustice in the criminal justice system that is abhorrent. That is the truth. It doesn't make me feel good to say that. I'm a former prosecutor. We have injustice in the criminal justice system, which is the basic purveyor of justice in this society. And it's not just George Floyd. You look back even in modern history in my lifetime. This started with Rodney King. Rodney King was 30 years ago. We suffered in this city through Abner Louima and Amadou Diallo and Sean Bell and Eric Garner. How many times have we seen the same situation? Yes, the names change. But the color doesn't. And that is the painful reality of this situation. And it's not just 30 years. It is this nation's history of discrimination and racism dating back hundreds of years. That is the honest truth. And that's what's behind this anger and frustration. And I share the outrage at this fundamental injustice. I do. And that's why I say I figuratively stand with the protesters. But violence is not the answer. It never is the answer. As a matter of fact, it is counterproductive because the violence then obscures the righteousness of the message and the mission. And you lose the point by the violence in response. And it allows people who would choose to scapegoat to point to the violence rather than the action that created the reaction. The violence allows people to talk about the violence 
as opposed to honestly addressing the situation that incited the violence. The violence doesn't work. Martin Luther King, Dr. King, God rest his soul, he taught us this. He taught us this. He knew better than anyone who is speaking to us today on this issue. Returning hate for hate multiplies hate. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Yes, outrage, yes, anger, yes, frustration, but not violence. Last night we saw disturbing violent clashes amidst protests right here in New York City in Brooklyn. Uh, and we all saw the video last night. I'm asking Attorney General James to review the actions and the procedures that were used last night because the public deserves answers and they deserve accountability. Uh, I spoke with the mayor. He wants an independent review of what happened yesterday. I agree and we agree that the Attorney General is an independently elected official in the state of New York. Many other states, the Attorney General is appointed by the governor, not here. She's an independently elected uh, official. Uh, she has proven herself uh, competent and capable in being independent, and we're going to ask her to uh, take uh, a short period of time review last night and to do a report to the public and let's see what we can learn of what was done right, what was done wrong, because people do deserve answers. We had legislators who were at the protest, state legislators, uh, last night, uh, and there was a significant amount of concern about what actions were taken. Uh, but on the larger point, in this pandemic, over the past 91 days, we have done extraordinary things. When they first talked to me about this virus, they were not sure it could be controlled. When we first talked about socially distancing, nobody knew what that meant. Nobody knew that you could even do it. Would people listen? Would New Yorkers listen? Which takes the question of people to a different level because we're New Yorkers. Could a government official, could a governor get up and say to 19 million people, we need to close down everything. We need to socially distance, six feet, wear masks, PPE. Could a community rise to that occasion? Could this virus be stopped? Was that curve going to continue to go up? Nobody knew. And it was all dependent on what people did what people did, what the community did. And on top of it, New York was hit the worst. We have more cases than any state. We have more cases per capita than most countries. But because we were hit the worst, I think it brought out the best. And I think our better angels won. I think our better angels responded. And I think our better angels rose to the occasion. We helped each other. We respected each other. We protected each other. We were there one for the other. People across the state volunteering to help other parts of the state. People from upstate coming down to help downstate. People from downstate going to help upstate. People from across the country coming to help us leaving their homes in other states to come here. It was really community and mutuality and all the things we hope to be manifested. It happened. We needed people to rise above themselves, to get past the pettiness, to get past the selfishness, to be bigger than themselves. And they did it. And for me, the microcosm of it, the metaphor for all of it was the frontline workers. What they did. And they are modern day heroes. I was saying to the people of this state, 
this is dangerous, stay home, protect yourself, protect your family. And in the same breath, I was saying to the frontline workers, not you, you have to go to work tomorrow morning. In the same breath. And I was saying to myself, what happens if they don't? What happens if they don't? What happens if the frontline workers say, this is dangerous, I'm afraid, I'm going to stay home like everybody else. What would have happened if the nurses didn't show up and the doctors didn't show up and the bus drivers didn't show up and the subway conductors didn't show up and the food delivery people didn't show up and the pharmacists didn't show up and the delivery women and men didn't show up? What would have happened if there was no food on the shelves? What would have happened if there was no one in the emergency room when you showed up? You want to talk about crisis. You want to talk about pain. But these frontline workers, despite the risk, because I had to highlight the risk because I needed people to stay home, so I spoke to the risk. But then despite the risk, I had to ask them, my voice speaking for all of us, please help us and go to work tomorrow. Please show up for work because it's your role, it's your duty, it's your obligation to us. And they did. And they did. I was not comfortable asking. I will tell you the God's honest truth. I knew they were putting themselves at risk. I knew it. And I, I don't envy any chief executive of this nation who has to order women and men to go to war. I can't imagine how that would feel. I know how I felt having to ask our frontline workers, I need you. I need you to show up. And they did. And they put their lives at risk to serve others. And in that moment, they were not black frontline workers. They were not white frontline workers. They were not Latino frontline workers. They were not Bronx frontline workers. They were not Brooklyn frontline workers. They were not Buffalo frontline workers. They were just Americans. They were New Yorkers. They were linked by the commonality of humanity. And the better angels said, get past your fear. Get past your weakness. Don't stay home. Rise up. Be stronger. Be better than you, than you think you can be yourself. Get in touch with your strength and hear that strength. And they did it. And we acted as one. This diverse community of New York, people from all over the globe, different languages, we acted as one. And many of those people gave their lives for us during that time. They gave their lives because we asked them to show up for us, and they did. Let's learn from their example. Let's understand what they did. We see all the success in those numbers and how far we've come. It didn't just happen. People literally gave their lives so others could live. They are the frontline heroes. They are the ones who charged up the hill when they knew the enemy was firing. They showed that same bravery that they they showed that same courage. And they did it only because we asked, not because they were getting paid more money or they were going to get a medal, because they didn't. They did it because it was the right thing to do. They did it out of love. That's what they did. They didn't die in vain. They have changed me. And I believe they have made me a better person by their example and by their lesson. And I will never, ever forget what they did. And I will strive 
to be half as courageous and half as brave as they have been. And to hear those better angels and to get in touch with that strength and to respond from that strength, that's their spirit. Yes, be outraged. Yes, be frustrated. Demand better. Demand justice. But not violent. Not violent productive and smart, act from strength, not fear, love, not hate. And there is nothing that we can't overcome. We showed that here. We beat this damn virus. And if we're smart, we'll continue to beat it. But the way we beat this virus, we can beat the virus of racism, we can beat the virus of discrimination, we can beat the virus of inequality, if we can beat this virus, we can beat anything. Look at it, that strength that people showed. You can do anything with that strength. Our leaders may not be as good as the American people and as strong as the American people and as kind as the American people, but it's still we the people. It is still we the people and we the people shall still overcome. They showed us the way forward. And the way forward is to be New York tough, smart, united, disciplined, loving, loving, loving. They gave their lives out of love, and we respect that. I'm going to sign a bill today that gives death benefits to the families of all the frontline workers who gave their lives for us. It is the least we can do to say thank you, and we honor you, and we remember you. You gave your lives for us. We will be there to support your families going forward. That's what this bill does, and it is my honor to sign it now. We say to their families, we thank you. We grieve for your loss, and we will always be there for you the way you were there for us. Thank you. Governor, um, this morning, uh, Jamal Williams and Jamal Williams right now, had a news conference, and um, they were critical of the way the police uh, operated last night. We demanded an apology from the mayor, and what they didn't like was the wall of police officers in front of uh, the Broadway Center and in front of the other places, the precinct. Um, do you agree with that? They said, no, they should have been way off, blocks away. Yeah, I think uh, you're going to have a lot of opinions about last night, what happened. Uh, and there are going to be a lot of opinions that have merit. There'll be people who criticize the police, There'll be people who criticize the protesters. Uh, this is New York, and this is a very contentious situation. That's why I think the smart way forward is uh, let's get an independent review. Let's find out exactly what happened, what procedures were used, what was right, what was wrong. That's what the attorney general will do. Uh, I'm gonna, going to ask the attorney general to get the review done quickly. I'd like to see it in 30 days. So uh, we don't have to have a prolonged argument about it, but review all the facts, review the police pre, uh, procedures, review the uh, crowd's actions, and give us an independent review. Non-political, right? This is political silly season. Uh, and this is an issue that will raise a lot of politics on a lot of levels. Uh, but the Attorney General is independently elected. She's not in a political season. There is no election for the Attorney General this year. Uh, so just give us a factual review. And let's get that review and then I'll respond to the facts in that review because people do deserve answers and people do deserve accountability. If someone did something wrong, they should be held accountable. They said that this wall of police officers that encouraged the violence, that, that it never, it, they suggested it wouldn't have happened if the police were 
uh, giving a show of force. Yeah, so let the Attorney General look at the police procedure of using a wall, if that's proper, improper. So we're still in the midst of the pandemic, of course, and people are out there protesting, they're not wearing masks, they're not social distancing. Does that concern you at all? Yes. Yes. Uh, look, on the protest demonstrations, you have a right to demonstrate, you have a right to protest, God bless America. Uh, you don't have a right to infect other people. You don't have a right to uh, uh, act in a way that's going to jeopardize public health. And, you know, the, the effectiveness of the mask, as simple as it seems, uh, the more we learn, the more effective it is. Demonstrate with a mask on. What's the difference? I mean, I just, I still do not get it. Uh, and look, I've been having a lot of conversations and we're doing ads and all sorts of ways to communicate. And we had Chris Rock and Rosie Perez and uh, different people bringing their credibility to the situation. It's primarily uh, difficult with young people. I think the way they first heard about this virus was that they were immune. Uh, I remember there's a video clip uh, during the Florida spring break where you had all those young people on, on the beach in Florida. And there's a clip of a, a young gentleman saying, uh, I'm not going to let this coronavirus bother me. Uh, I can deal with it. Only old people have to worry about it. Uh, it's not going to stop me from partying. Is it really? Uh, party on. Forget COVID. Yeah, even if you think you're a superhero uh, because you're young and you're strong, you can get it and then infect someone else. So it's just wholly irresponsible. And uh, I don't see any justification not to wear it, and I'm going to try as hard as I can through every vehicle uh, that I can to say, look, you're just wrong. You know, you can have an opinion, but there are also facts. Uh, and you're wrong not to wear a mask. I think you're disrespectful. I think you're putting other people's lives at risk needlessly. Uh, and those are facts, right? So demonstrate, wear a mask. Governor, this is the, the second review that's been announced today over the events of last night. Uh, people are still on edge. There are more protests planned for today. It doesn't sound like police are going to wait 30 days on how they should respond. Protesters aren't going to wait 30 days on how they should respond. What do you think needs to change so this doesn't happen again tonight? Well, I have no doubt uh, that the mayor and the police are going to have serious conversations today about last night. And they should. Uh, we, we all saw the video. And uh, accountability works. And I'm sure, I know the mayor uh, has taken note of last night, and I'm sure there, there are going to be conversations today about how to handle tonight and going forward. Governor, as much as the protests last night highlight potential systemic um, issues with the police response to the protest, you know, the, video, the most prominent video of the officer throwing the woman on the ground, you know, has uh, led to some details that this was uh, the latest in the history of bad behavior by this one cop. A lot of state lawmakers are now saying that 50A in state law should be repealed. Do you support that? And would you use your influence as governor to make sure that cops' disciplinary records are actually subject to public disclosure? Yeah. Uh, 50A is the, for people who don't know what 50A is, which is 99.9% .9 of the normal people. Uh, 50A is a, a state regulation about disclosure of dis prior disciplinary uh, actions vis-a-vis -vis police officers. I do not believe 50A uh, can, that 50A as an existing law prohibits the disclosure. I have done council's opinions that say that. Uh, I think local elected officials across the state could release disciplinary records even with the existing 50A law if they wanted to. 
I think they don't want to, so they say I can't, right? The best way to say no, as an elected official, politician, is to say I can't. Uh, I don't believe that's true. I believe they can with the law as written. But just to make it simple, I would sign a bill today that reforms 50A. I would sign it today. So the legislature can now convene by Zoom, or however they do it, uh, pass the bill. I will sign it today. I can't be clearer or more direct than that. Let's take one more. Yes. We're in the Bronx, and there's a sizable community of Albanian Americans here. With respect to the medical data on minorities, aside from the African Americans and the Latino communities, do you have or do you expect to have any data on hospitalization, infections, death rate on the Albanian American community? That is a very good question. I do not know the percentages for the Albanian community. Uh, I don't know that they collect that in hospitals. But I will find out, and if we have it, we will uh, get it out to you forthwith. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. I'll see you tomorrow. I have to go to work. Can I take this? <laughs> yes. <laughs>